Good morning, and welcome to the second day, the fifth lecture of the DARPA Sheaf tutorial. And today we'll talk much more about computation of invariant features of sheaves. So computation of invariants, in particular focusing on homology and cohomology. Uh, so we'll do a lot of how do you take the sheaf constructions that we've thus far built and pull out useful pieces of information. So yesterday, if you will, is building up the high fidelity models as sheaves, and today is boiling out actionable, useful summaries of information from the sheaves that we've constructed. So a quick review of what yesterday we talked about. So we talked about how sheaves can build specific models that are faithful, accurately represent heterogeneous information frameworks, and looked at a whole bunch of models of this, but unfortunately, they can get really complicated. Um, you can have, if you're looking for a full fidelity model of a complicated and potentially large data system, you're going to have all of the complexity and size that you've asked for. So we need to be able to summarize that in some fashion. And really, the major problem that you typically run across with large data systems is that there's somewhat of a lack of algebraic structure, or there's quite a collection of different kinds of algebraic structure that don't fit together in some reasonable fashion. So that's, that's a problem, and that's something we want to rectify before we start actually doing computations. Because it's, it's worth noting that barring some somewhat esoteric theories, uh, if you want to compute invariants, you basically need to make use of linear algebra. And so you need something like an abelian group structure or something that looks very much like a vector space. Uh, so given that, we need to be able to translate our data from whatever it happens to be into something that is a vector space. We'd like to do that in a way that preserves the structure that we've got thus far. Um, and if you don't do that, you can get very confused. Now, even when you do translate to linear algebra, it can be somewhat of a problem. So we'll see exactly what the interpretational difficulties are and take a look at how they work. So the focus for today is computation and building algorithmic actionable summaries of high fidelity data stored in sheaves. So we're looking for sheaf invariants, things that if I take a sheaf and I look at an isomorphic sheaf, I should get something that's basically the same set of invariants. Um, things that are translated nicely by way of sheaf morphisms. Okay. Now the summaries that we get should be computationally viable in some fashion. How do we do that? How do we understand computational viability? Well, one of the problems is that sheaf theory is actually quite basic. Although I've defined sheaf theory in terms of sheaves of sets primarily, built it off of set theory, it's actually possible to build sheaf theory on top of category theory and build set theory on top of that. In fact, reasonably famous uh, understanding of sheaf theory is that it actually is sufficient to, to describe logic and various other kinds of logics can be built on top of sheaf theory. Um, sounds a little circular, but it's, it's possible. And this means that you can run very quickly into computational intractability issues. Uh, it's very easy to build sheaves where computing the space of sections is an NP-hard or NP-complete problem. We'd like to avoid that. We'd like to have polynomial time algorithms that we can guarantee are going to finish at some reasonable amount of time. And the way we're going to do that is by, by way of linear algebra. Okay, so where are we? So yesterday we talked about topology, about sheaves, build a whole bunch of models of sheaves of different sorts of data systems. Today we're on the, the computational and analytic side of things. I'm going to start off basically building up some background material for these sorts of computations. So we're going to start out with some linear algebra and some categorification, which we're going to use to turn our data from whatever data type it is, into a category, and then out of a category into linear algebra, and how to compute, in general, what homological features are of these linear algebraic constructions. This is prerequisite for then putting together the sheaf model with the analytic model to get sheaf cohomology, and that, that will be in the last two lectures. OK, so what are we going to do right now? Right now, what we're going to do is we're going to try to encode our data in a way that is convenient, a convenient computation. We're going to build out and describe what homological algebra looks like. Very briefly, homological algebra is a huge subject on its own. Uh, but basically, what we want out of it is some kind of multi-scale, multi-resolution linear algebra. And then we'll 
tackle what kinds of invariants there are for these algebraic constructions. So in some sense, this is going to feel a little, a little divorced from the sheaf theory initially. We'll see why we, we're going to focus primarily on, on just the stocks first, focus in on how to represent that data in a reasonable fashion, and then look at some of the constructions that come out of that. that that'll happen in this lecture, and then we'll bring it back into the sheaf theory so that we can see how this all works. OK. So first of all, what we want to talk about is encoding data in the stocks of our sheaf, encoding it for computation. Now, when we think about the kinds of data that might be in our sheaf, if you have images, those are vector spaces. If you have, say, an audio stream, that's probably a vector space or a function space of some fashion. But it doesn't have to be. Could be set data. We saw last time uh, this construction of a wireless network sheaf where the stocks were lists of names, names of nodes or possibly an idle state. That's a set. It's not a vector space. There's no algebraic structure to speak of. I can't add two nodes to make anything reasonable. So that makes it hard to compute with. And indeed, that's the source of potential NP-complete problems. A particular chief example doesn't have any, but it can be an issue. So we want to turn things into, into that reasonable place where we can do computation. So, Fasten your seatbelts. This is going to be a, a bit abstract. The payoff is indeed worth it. And indeed, perhaps the definition of topology may not be the complete most abstract thing we're going to talk about. But I think this, this is, I, I'm going to try to keep this relatively concrete. OK. So what kind of data types are there? So first of all, thank Cliff for drawing this diagram. Uh, these are various kinds of data types that are out there that are often used in data science. So we have things on the very top of the diagram, categorical variables. Those are set value kind of things. They don't have much internal structure. They're, for instance, you know, cat, dog, bird, nothing else, no other further structure. They could be various kinds of animals. Now, you might look at that and say, well, actually, cats and dogs are both mammals, birds are not. So maybe they're related in some fashion. Maybe you've got a relation that allows you to describe the fact that a cat dog, they're related to one another by way of the re relationship that they're both mammals. Um, so you have some kind of relational structures, and one of the more rich re relational structures is partial ordinal. So you might have a partial order applied to some of your data. Uh, high, medium, low is a good example of, a, of an ordinal, which is a more refined type. Uh, and then if you refine even further, you get something that's a scalar, so a real number, for instance. And on the other hand, so those are semantic, semantic kinds of data, discrete data, if you will. On the other hand, if you've got numerical data, we've got scalars. If we in, take a look at what, what you could do with scalars, you could also, instead of measuring a, scale, a single scalar, you can measure an interval, confidence intervals, or that sort of thing. And of course, intervals can be generalized a bit up to probability distributions. So this, this is not everything, by all means, but this is many of the kinds of data types that we'd like to work with. OK, so how do, we, how do we manipulate these data types? This is sort of a zoo of data types. And I think it's important to think about what we want to do with them to turn them into and enrich them into a vector space type. OK, so let me give you a very general kind of construction that allows you to think about vector space data when you didn't have vector space data to begin with. So if I have just two sets, sets A and B, and I've some function between them, function that goes from A to B. OK, just on its own, that's a set valued function. There's no further structure on A and B, and that's it. Well, there's a standard trick, a standard trick called a lifting into a linear algebraic setting that allows us to turn this into a vector space linear map. Um, it's one possible way to turn your data into vector spaces. It's, in some sense, the most basic and often gives you something to work with. Not always the right way, but it's not a bad way. So let me explain how this works. So we've got my set A. And what I'm going to do is, rather than thinking of this as just a set, I'm going to think of this abstractly as a basis for a vector space. So each element out of A, I'm going to think of as basis element in some vector space. So the dimension of that vector space, which we'll call RA, the dimension of that vector space is then the cardinality of A. And every element of this vector space is then a linear combination, in some abstract sense, of the elements of A. Do the same thing for B. 
Now, what this does for me is, well, it's not immediately obvious what it does. It's I've encoded each of the sets as vector space elements, or as vector spaces. And I have maps, these one times maps, which purely are interpret elements of A and B as elements of this vector space. So I take an element of A, if I map it through this map, I get a vector whose components are zero except for that element. And similarly over here. Now if I got this map, this function, that translates elements of A to elements of B, then that turns out that I can go ahead and construct in a reasonable way, and I'll show you how to do that on the board in a moment, that is a linear map between these two vector spaces. Now, the way you define it is you define it by writing it down on the basis and extending it to the rest of the vector space. Usually very easy to write down as a matrix if it's a finite set here and a finite set here. And the nice thing about what, the way I've defined this linear map is that this diagram commutes, which says, in essence, that this function rf is capturing the effect of this function f. And generally speaking, there are more elements here than there are here. There are more elements here than there are here. So if I take a typical element over here, map it over to here, so take the linear map, typically I will not be able to, put, to invert this map or this map. But if I started out over here, map an element of A over and then over again, I, I will be able to pull it down because the diagram commutes. So that says that it's preserving and capturing the same information that was in it. Okay, so let me give you an example, because this, this sort of, yeah. So you just said you can't invert the mapping from B to the linear. Can't invert this map in general. But then you said. I said in the specific case, where, where you started out with an element over here, tracked it up to here, that is the, the, the case when I can, in fact, infer that I can, that I can go back. I'm not inverting the map. Are you going to explain that? I am. Okay, so let's take a set A and a set B. So cat, dog, and bird. And I'm going to write this down as mammal, not mammal. Those are two sets. And my function f is going to do more or less the obvious thing. F of cat is mammal. F of dog is mammal. And F of bird is not. Okay, so that's the setup. I have two sets and a function. And those two sets and the function, that is completely defining the set construction. So now what I want to do is I want to show you what each of these spaces looks like and what that R of F, RF map looks like. So first of all, the RA map, or the RA space, rather. Well, this is a space whose basis is the set A. It's a vector space whose basis is that set A. So it is a vector space whose dimension is 3. This is an R3. And I can think of it as having the basis abstracted, cat, dog, bird. So I can label the components of this vector space as cat, dog, bird. And I'll keep that order. Similarly, similarly, RB is spanned over mammal and not mammal. So that is a two-dimensional vector space. OK. So now. What does this map RF look like? This map RF, what does it look like? Well, I said it's gonna, got to be a matrix. And it's got to go from RA to RB. So that's a map from R3 to R2. In particular, it's got to be a 2 by 3 matrix. So let's write down what that 2 by 3 matrix is. Now remember I said the components, 2 by 3 matrix, the components are 
based on what these elements of the, these sets are, because those are the bases. So this is the basis element corresponding to cat. This is the basis element corresponding to dog and bird. And here is the mammal. And here is not. Now, I want to set this map up so that this diagram commutes. So in particular, if I take cat and instantiate it as a vector, what vector is it? It's 1, 0, 0. The cat vector is 1, 0, 0 because the first component is 1 for cat, 0 for dog, 0 for bird. So 1, 0, 0. And that 1, 0, 0 vector, where does it go? Well, it should read out mammal. Okay, so that one zero zero vector should map out cat. Now it's to mammal. Similarly, dog to mammal, and bird should not. And then that fills out the rest of the map. So now you can try this. Try this out. If I take the vector cat, take the vector cat, so if I go R F times cat. What's cat? That's 1, 0, 0. If I do this matrix multiplication, what do I get? 1, 0, which is saying that this thing is a mammal. Notice 1, 0 is a basis element for RB, pointing out the base, which basis elements, pointing out the basis element corresponding to mammal. That's what I mean that you can, in some cases, pull this back. Now, now if I had gotten the answer 1, 1, I'd be kind of out of luck. I don't know, is it a bird, is it a mammal, or is it not? It's me. So this kind of construction, though, allows me to turn this set-valued function now into a manifestly linear map. What I've done by doing this, in fact, is I've added some additional quantitative data that wasn't there before. What I've done is I've ascri ascribed a real number as a coefficient you can interpret this as perhaps the number of cats, the number of dogs, and the number of birds. If I then pass through this linear map, what I get out is the number of mammals and the number of non-mammals. So if I have changed this to I've got three cats, two dogs, and one bird, do that matrix multiplication, I get five mammals and one non-mammal. So the interpretation here by doing this particular lifting is that I've, I've added quantitative data to this categorical data. Now, it, it does have some funny properties. One of the funny properties that comes out of this is I could have negative numbers of animals. The interpretation doesn't mean that much sense, or it doesn't make that much sense in this context. Um, and in fact, if you really care about not having negative numbers, instead of building vector spaces, you can use semi-rings and other such things to avoid that problem. But this is at least a rudimentary picture of what it is that we're going to do in order to get our data into vector spaces. Questions on this before we proceed? You discussed the inversions. Okay, so the, the inversions. Specifically, what, what we're saying here is, can I invert this map? If I have a vector here, any random vector, uh, what will it be? Well, it will be some linear combination of cats, dogs, and birds. Can I find a single cat, dog, or bird that gave rise to that? Typically not. So that's why this map is not invertible. The only time that I, that I can, in fact, invert this map, it's not really inverting the map, um, is when I happen to be sitting on a basis element here. The same is true over here. The only time I can end up inverting this map, and that's in quotes, is when I happen to land on a basis element, which, if you look at this, the only way that's going to happen is if I started out on a basis element here. Yes? No, it was the same question. Ah. I'm not sure you answered way more. Which helps you. OK. OK. So. Okay. Okay. So what, what, we're, what we're really trying to, to address here is how do I get from data that is now lifted into here down? Back, and in some sense, that's an interpretation question. How do, how do I take the data which is now 
turned into this vector space? How do I pull it out? Because typically what I'll see, say if my data source will return a set, single set valued piece of information, it will give me one element out of this set. Data source will say, I've got one element out of this set, say dog. Well, if I take dog, I can interpret that as a vector here, as a vector which is 0, 1, 0. Sure. Now, 0, 1, 0, where does that map over here? Well, do out the matrix multiplication, it is 1, 0. 1, 0 is, in fact, the image of one of the basis elements over here. So we can invert in that particular case. Now, typically, though, we cannot invert. We have added additional out-of-band information. I guess what I'm looking for is an example of where you can. What, where you can? Where you cannot. Oh, when you cannot. OK. So actually, I've got one here. So I, 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 if I started out with a vector, some random vector over here. But where did that come from? It had to come from A. It this come from air. You didn't make up a, a vector. A was sure. an essence, you know, dog, sure. cat, dog, and bird. It's not a combination. Yeah, but if you have dog, cat, bird, you would have hit A, R, A. Yes. That's right. That aren't in A. That's right. So, okay. So maybe, maybe your maybe, maybe maybe your question is more the matter of if our data source returns only A, then we will never get other funny elements here. That's the only way to resolve an ambiguity. You've got two different data sources saying two different things. That's right. In larger space, there is a solution. That's right. In that original semantic space with only three elements, there wasn't a solution. Then you've got to figure out what to how to interpret this conflicted answer that. Yes. So, so in, in, in particular, if you're thinking of this purely as the data source that you've gotten, that's, that's not going to result in an invertibility problem. It's only going to come about when I have different data sources that are returning information that is otherwise incompatible. Is that what you mean on the lower right? What we can if we do this RF program? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Then you can, to Joe's question as well, with those conditions and those conditions only, yes. you can recover some kind of invertibility on the. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Those conditions and those conditions only. Yeah. Are you, would it be appropriate to see an example through to that? Um, okay, sure. We could do that. I, I, I think, in, in some sense, what, what we're saying here is. Th these being bigger data spaces give you some more flexibility. And by giving you more flexibility, that you can solve some problems that you couldn't have solved in the original data spaces due to incompatibilities. Mm -hmm. And that results in sometimes having interpretation issues that now where I've landed here is outside of the image of this map. The only time that I end up in that map or in the image of that map is when I basically started with something. Okay. It's not an if and only if. It, 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 it's weaker than that because in particular this matrix uh, may not have full rank when I'm done. If this matrix does not have full rank, then it's not an if and only if condition. Um, and so that, that's somewhat of an issue. Okay, so if I, if I take a look at what, it, what does this composition of this map look like? This is the composition that takes an element of a, maps it to a vector, a vector. so take A, turn it into a vector. And that was your prior example. And that, that is the prior example. Yeah. yeah. So it's one zero zero and then one zero. That's right. Okay. So then how would that invert? So that, that inverts because you've landed now on the image of a basis vector. Okay. So it's, so then we, yeah, of course. So then yeah. That, that, that it inverts directly back. It returns mammal. It returns mammal. Unambiguously. Unambiguously, yes. Okay. Um, my next question yes. is how meaningful is it to have RA as larger than or equal to RB? How meaningful is it to have which RA be a, of higher dimensionality? Of higher dimensionality. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. So the, in this particular construction, that the dimension of RA is the cardinality of A. We've, con we've constructed it that way. 
Um, and so the question is, are there circumstances where you want this to be bigger? And I, typically, I've not seen that to be a, a, a useful construction. Typ typically, adding additional dimensionality to this is adding additional out-of-band information that was not present in this original data source. So typically, I've not seen that to be of a lot of value. And the difficulty is that then you end up with more interpretational issues over here. You said negative mean cardinality or dimensionality? Yeah, I don't think. I, I, I don't think you understood each other. OK. Uh, you mean that cardinality is lower than So the dimensionality of RA is the same as the cardinality. Of that's right. RA has a bigger space right. more elements in RA than A, but they're of effectively of the same dimensionality if you think about it. Right. There's a chance he could have meant dimensionality of That's, no, no, no. I, I, and A doesn't have a dimension. Yeah, a, a, a is not a vector space. It is right. purely a set, so it does not have a dimension. Right. Yeah, in fact, actually, if, you, if this is yeah. the cardinality of A is the dimensionality. And the cardinality of R is definitely bigger. Than yeah, this is def definitely, it definitely quite, quite a bit bigger, especially R is uncountable. In this particular case, yes. Yeah. yes. But it might not be. But it might not be. Yeah, there's no, there's no reason to assume that, especially if this map is, is not an on, if this map is not on to. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, using the word risky here, do you just define that? I've seen that in other places. Okay, so, so the idea of, of lifting is that you've started out with some particular map, and you're asking for a map that ends up in a commutative diagram, like, like such, that mimics the same kind of properties that this map F had to begin with. So in this particular case, what we mean by lifting is that when, when you've built this diagram as such, that this RF map is recovering the information of F that we started with. Is there any conditions like it has to be more abstract? Or no, not necessarily. Typi typically when people do lifting, they do end up being more abstract, or they do end up being to passing through some larger space. In another context, I've seen that yeah. it's more so, abstract. So, so typically, it's either more abstract or a larger space. Okay. Now, Charlie, you had a question. Um, I, I think it's been answered. So the problem would occur when R of A has much more dimension, maybe from another data set. Yes. Sure. And, and then it would not be inferable because you sure. have You've got additional, yes. Additional Absolutely. Dimension. Absolutely, yeah. And, and that sort of thing is, I, I, as, as I was saying a, a moment ago, I don't typically see that because then what you've got is the, the right way to represent that is to make this A bigger, to capture that additional represent. So we're, if, if we're focusing right now just on the level of a single stalk in a sheaf, that's a single data source. If I have other data sources elsewhere, that's going to come in as other stalks. Right. And so, I mean, that could be a programming problem. Okay. We'll, we'll, we'll see some examples like this as, as we move along as well, where, where, where we've spliced in various kinds of data sets. We end up with a larger set here, and that translates into some special structure in, in this resulting vector space. I mean, so far, this is single variable. Right. Single variable. Simple data right. mode. But it's the principle. It's, it's the principle that, that, that we're going to carry through. Okay. So let's, let's do that. Let, let's, let's move ahead. So the general idea that we're trying to do here is we're trying to take our data, which are in various sets. They have functions between them. They've got some structure. And we're going to try to lift them into things that represent structure, things that capture the structure. And then we're going to, going to try to turn that into linear algebra, much the way this example has turned our structure into linear algebra. Now, there isn't much structure to speak of here. It's just a set. But we want to have that structure available to us. So the way that we do this is by way of something that goes under the rather unseemly name of categorification. It's big, basically, what it means is we're going to take our data, set value data or other data that are sets with extra structure, and turn them into something that encapsulates that whole structure as well. So that's a category. And then we're going to take that and turn it into the this allows us to normalize the data that's stored in our sheaf 
so that we all of the data types that we see, this might be set value, this might be categorical value, or this may be partial order value, this might be numerical. Put them all on the same theoretical footing. They'll all be categories. And then once they're all in categories, we can do a construction much like what we did here. We turn it into vector spaces, and that will enable computation. Now, it's worth noting that developing the appropriate categorifications for data types is somewhat of an art in that it's not as systematic as one might like, and it is very much problem dependent. So we'll see some examples of that as we go on. If you need more examples or more detailed examples, we can certainly discuss that offline. OK, so first of all, I have to tell you what a category is. So a category is it's a very general kind of object, or rather, it's a very general kind of mathematical construction. And it's got objects, and it's got what are called morphisms. You can think of objects as being nodes in a directed graph and morphisms being particular kind of edges in that directed graph. So categories are directed graph-like, but they have an additional structure. The additional structure that they have is that if I have morphisms that go one to the next to the next, so I have a directed edge from A to B and another directed edge from B to C, I can combine them to get a single edge going from A to C. Composition. Composition is associative and that there is an identity element, or identity morphism that captures some kind of identity for that composition process. Now, this is a very abstract definition. And the reason for its abstraction is that it can be used across many different branches of mathematics. And in fact, this is a very foundational structure that can be used for defining most of mathematics. Actually, it can be used to define all of mathematics in the right context. So here's how this works. Let me give you some examples of some categories that are out there. The first category that everyone likes to start with is the category called set. This is the category of sets. And set has as objects the vertices in this directed graph. Those objects of set, we'll write OB. Set. Um, th those are that's a that's a collection of, of sets. So every set, every set that you can think of, that's an object. That's a vertex. Every set that you can think of, that's an object in set. Now, on the other hand, the morphisms. These are directed edges. These are functions. So if I have a function and I have another function and they've got, they look like this, so I have a function from one set to another and I've got another function that goes from B to C, then I can form, this is standard set theory, I can form the function G composed with F and it goes from A to C and there's a unique definition of this thing. There's also an identity morphism for every set. What does it do? It takes every element, do that same element. It doesn't do anything at all. So there's identity on A. Well, that goes from A to A, and it is indeed the identity function. It doesn't do anything at all. It's a category of sets. It's a very basic category. There are other categories out there. There are, say, for instance, the category of vector spaces. And the great thing about this sort of thing is I can say a category of, if I want to look at the category of vector spaces, do it this way. Actually, basically, that's all the same. VEC is the category of vector spaces. The objects of VEC, what are they? They are, well, they're vector spaces. So every vector space is an object. It's a vertex in the appropriate directed graph. Every morphism of VEC, a VEC, what is that? 
linear maps. These are linear maps. Are we going to do anything about what field the vector space is over? Or are we going to just have one enormous category where you have only, more, only morphisms make sense if the vector spaces are over the same field? OK, good question. Um, and generally speaking, I, I, I like to think of the whole thing. It's the whole thing where, where I've only got yeah, if I'm, if I'm concerned about vector spaces in general, these are linear maps between spaces of the same field. Yes. Sure. That, that's, that's a condition that I'm totally happy to do. On the other hand, most of what I work with are real vector spaces or complex vector spaces. But fair enough. Okay. So that's another category. There are more exotic categories out there. There's category top, which is the objects are topological spaces. The morphisms are continuous functions. There's another category, a category of K manifolds. Those are manifolds of smoothness K and whose morphisms are, have functions that are K smooth, CK smooth functions. They have K continuous derivatives. There's category of groups. The morphisms are group homomorphisms. There are lots and lots of these various categories out there, more than you can think of. Uh, that's probably a theorem. Anyway, um, what's interesting, though, is that you can also do things like take an individual data structure that you're interested in and turn that, too, into a category. So for instance, if you're interested in the category of, oh, I don't know, category of a particular partially ordered set, Take a post set, you can think of the objects as being the elements of the post set and the morphisms being the order relation. So you can encapsulate your data as a category. That's kind of interesting, kind of useful. Now, how do I know if two objects are really the same thing? Well, they're the same thing if they are isomorphic, as in there's a morphism that goes from one to the other and one that instantiates the inverse. And by inverse, I mean if I compose them, I get the identity. Good structure, good structure to have. This allows me to start identifying which objects are the same. So in particular, in the category of vector spaces, when are two vector spaces isomorphic? They're isomorphic if and only if. I've got a linear map that goes from one to the other, and it's invertible. That's pretty cool. And of course, if you're dealing with finite dimensional vector spaces, that's, of course, when they have the same dimension. So that, I, this generalizes that notion of isomorphism. Now, how do I? Manipulate categories. Well, I take a category and I want something that's going to act like a function on categories. But now it's got to do two things. It's got to translate the objects and it's got to translate the morphisms. So in particular, what we wanted to do is we wanted to take a category and turn it so that every object in the first category turns into an object of the second and every morphism gets turned from a morphism into the first to a morphism in the second. This lifting we just did on the board a moment ago is a functor. We took category C was set in our case, category D was vec. We took set, cat, dog, bird, set, turned it into an object of the other category, which is the vector space R3. And we did it so that this morphism from cat, dog, bird to mammal, not mammal, got turned into a linear map between R3 and R2. So that was a functor that we built. So a functor does some, something like a type change, changing a type. So that's what, we, that's what we built. We built a functor that translated from one type to the other. Now, functors come in two flavors, depending on whether or not they preserve the order of composition or not. This particular one we made actually does preserve the order of composition. There are others that reverse it. And then sometimes it's useful to distinguish between faithful and faithless functors. And that really is whether or not they preserve the structure and morphisms. The function we just created, turning cat, dog, bird at, into that vector space, that's a faithful functor. Which is to say, to Joe's point, we haven't lost any data doing that. We, may have, we have added it additionally. OK. So now this is a little abstract. So if I take my data and I put it into a category, well, it would be useful to understand 
whether or not I've preserved that structure. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to say that if I've got a set to start with, a set like cat, dog, bird, I can think of it as a category as well. Think of it as a category as opposed to take a functor into it. This is a little different idea. Um, and really what you're doing is you're taking all the isomorphism classes and mapping them down to the set through a very particular choice of isomorphism. This is called a decategorification. Now, essentially what we're trying to do here is we're taking all of the sets that we have of various cardinality. Sets of all different cardinality, turning them into vector spaces, and then translating them back down. This function does that sort of composition. Unfortunately, and, and this is sort of obvious from, from the construction that I gave, these, these categorifications are not necessarily unique. I could, in fact, have made this a much bigger vector space. I could have had cat, dog, bird translate into a much bigger space. Not unique. Turns out that's OK. With a good categorification, the morphisms turn into appropriate functions or relations on the set. OK. So this is, this is a very abstract kind of construction that we've got. And that was probably altogether too much abstraction. So let's make that concrete. So what, you, what we really want to do in that, that categorification that we were looking at a, a moment ago, what we're really doing is we're going from are set to a vector space. What we really want to do is we want to pass through this categorification so we preserve the structure of our data. Now, a set doesn't have much structure to begin with. But if we have a partial order, that does have some structure. This is a partial order. And we turn this into a category. So the objects are the elements of the partial order. And the relations between them are morphisms in this category then this decategorification map does something useful. So let me show you how that works. So if I have a partial order, let's say I've got a partial order. Partial order P, and it's got three elements. Got A, it's got B, and it's got C. A is bigger than equal to C, and C is, and B is also bigger than equal to C. So in particular, A, B, A is bigger than C, B is bigger than C, but A and B are not comparable. <clears throat> Very basic partial order. So the first thing that I might want to do is I might want to categorify this, and this is, this is a category, call it C. Uh, no, that's probably a bad choice of, of uh, we'll call it bold P. The objects, I said, were the elements. They are A, B, and C. And what are the morphisms? They're the relations. So in particular, let me write them all out. Here's A, here's B. Here's C. I have a relation like this. These are the two morphisms. And then I also have identity morphisms. So that's a complete description of the category. The total the complete description of the category. Now, so that if you ask now if I've got this, is this really a categorification? Well, you can ask. If I take a look at the isomorphism classes of this, what are the isomorphism classes? Well, A is isomorphic to itself. There are no morphisms leading out of A going anywhere else. Similarly, B, there are no morphisms leading out of B going anywhere else. So I cannot have an isomorphism from A to anything other than A, and similarly for B. And what about C? It does have some morphisms going out, but none come back in except C. So the only isomorphism classes of this category are the elements A, B, and C. So decat, decat of P, the isomorphism classes are precisely A, B, and C. Notice then that I can, without really doing any work, oops, A, B, and C, without doing any work, these are, in fact, the same elements of my partial order. So as sets, this is indeed a map which is bijective. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Technically, are those singletons? Uh, yes, technically, they're singletons. You're absolutely right. OK. 
So now, this bijective correspondence is there. What about on, on this direction? We can use the same categorification we used a moment ago, going the other direction. So th this map to P is merely taking A, A, B, B, and C, to C. OK? That's the, the map on the left. Now, the other map, the, the map to this vector space, well, in that case, what I think we should use is we should use this R of P space, this vector space, which is R3 and is spanned by each of these various elements as elements of the vector space. So, now, the decategorification map going from from the isomorphism classes to this vector space, what is it doing? Well, it takes A to the vector 1, 0, 0, takes B to 0, 1, 0, and takes C oops, to 0, 0, 1. It's no longer, an, it's not a bijective map because this is an uncountable set. This is a finite set, but this is what it does. It takes these elements this way. Now, what's interesting about this is it preserves the structure in the following way, because this category, the, this category for the post set that we've constructed has these morphisms here. These morphisms are actually instantiated as linear maps over here now. They're self-linear maps that we've got. Those self-linear maps, what do they look like? They're projections that take the subspace C to, to or rather, it takes the subspace a to C and B to C. So the relations of P are now linear maps. And in particular, I can write them in one fell swoop as taking, uh, let's see here, how does this go? This goes from, uh, <clears throat> right, so takes Got it backwards. C is on the bottom, so it's going to take A to C, A to C. This is A, B, and C. This is A, B, and C. It takes A to C, B to C, C to C, and the rest it leaves alone. So th this particular relation now, these self-linear maps written on top of this vector space, capture the fact that this is now a partial order. It has some additional structure encapsulated by a bunch of maps. Uh, I, I, yeah. Ah, yes. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. There we go. Okay. Is the P and like the same as this? The P the same as? The yes. So the, the little, the, this original P is playing the same role as S over here. The RP is playing the role of the V over there, and the bold P is playing the role of this category C. So A and B, for instance, what, what, I could, what I could have here is this is a partial ordered set. So you can think of any kind of partial order that you might have like this. So what's that? Cat, dog, mammal. Yep. Cat, dog, mammal. Both cats and dogs are mammals. Right. OK. So A is, in a sense, one thing. It's not a vector. That's right. Yep. You get every element that's less than or equal to that. That's exactly right. That's exactly what it does. So what we're thinking about here, in essence, then, is we're finding chains in this, ca in this category. That's kind of handy, because essentially what we're doing is we've got this linear structure is now representing the partial order structure that's embedded in this category. So now we've turned our data into linear maps. Now, when we've turned our data into linear maps, that means that we can do this kind of construction for whenever we can categor categorify our set in the right way. Yes? The categorization on the left is really quite different from the categorization on the Absolutely. Is, the is C unique? Is C unique? No. So there's even multiple ways of using this intermediate. 
Yes. Although, as you've done it, it's a trivial. I mean, it's, yes. It's, it's, it's the most straightforward way. The most straightforward way works for this guy. Is that, a, is that because the example is a partial order with yeah. a very simple structure? That's right. In other cases, it might not be so. Absolutely. Demanding. Absolutely. Right. So in essence, what we've done then is we've taken that ex initial example and turned it into, now, because this is bijective, we can turn it into this kind of map, translating our set into vector space data. So we've translated our sets into vector space data by way of using this internal structure, this category. So in essence, what we're doing is we're taking our sheaths, got data in them in whatever sets with extra structure. We can turn them into a category. And from that category, we can turn it into a vector space. Now, benefit of this sort of thing is we can do a lot more computations with vector spaces than we could with the sets with extra structure. We can do them in a uniform fashion now, where we can ask, use all the internal structure of this vector space encoded data. So, good example of this sort of thing, to make this very specific of when this turns out to be valuable, is to take the same cat, dog, bird example idea, and instead just start with one object, the set, 0, 1, set of binary values, and take all the Cartesian products as well. That's a good category to work with. And that's a good category to talk about logic circuits and logic functions. Now, if you think about logic functions, they are morphisms in the category set. They're functions, but they're not linear. But doing this lifting operation through this categorification, now we get linear maps on everything. So we can translate logic circuits, which you can think of as sheaves over this connection graph, to now be linearized in some fashion. Very handy, computationally very good. Okay, so we just saw this post set example. I just did this one. Uh, so in essence, what we're doing is we're tr taking our types, we're thinking of them in terms of sets with extra structure. We just reinterpret them as categories. Sort of as a side point, if I have then a, maps between different types, they're turned into functors. So in fact, what we end up with is now we end up with a sheaf of categories. Sheaf of categories. Now those are hard to compute with. I mean, sheaf of sets alone is hard enough to compute with. Sheaf of categories is probably worse. Probably? <laughs> Almost theorem it's worse. <laughs> okay. And what we're, but what we do then is we say, well, actually we're going to turn, we're going to decategorify back into this vector space. There are many ways to do this because there are many ways to categorify. But once I've done that, now everything is capable of computation. So there's, there's step one and before was the left yep. categorization into sheaves. Yep. And this is now the right categorization. Decategorification back, back into that. Into that. Yep, that's right. This is the right way to think about it. Okay, cool. So the payoff of this is that now we're preserving the structure of heterogeneous data. We're preserving it as linear structure. So we capture all the data's internal data structure that's there. We've got it all. We've got it rep represented as self-linear self maps on each of the stalks. So all that data structure is now present. We, we have not forgotten any of that additional structure that we might have had to keep as out-of-band information in the data sets. It's now present and now there. That's pretty cool. Now, here's an example of one of the things that can happen when you do this. So on, on the... This is taken from an example that is now very old, but is very useful to think about. Here is a data source. You can think of this data source as a camera. And here is a data source. You can think of it as a text analytic running on a news system. And you might ask, how do I forget the fact that there is some structure in order to put, the, this is a sheaf over a particularly very small edge, it's an edge with two vertices and one edge. How do I represent that? Well, over here, I have some data. I have P, which represents the <clears throat> place, and R, which represents the role of various people in a city. And so, for instance, I have some people at City Hall, some people at Main Street, some people at Broadway. And they have different roles. Maybe they're police. Maybe they're demonstrating. It happens a lot in this fine city here. Um, or they might just be bystanders or people just doing, going about their daily business. Now, this other information source carries similar information. It's got a place, and it has another variable intensity, which is not represented here. And both of them have size. 
And one of the interesting things that we saw with the cat, dog, bird example is that size comes along for the ride. It's a numerical variable that you didn't have to worry about to begin with. So if you just take the place and roll, categorify it in this way, turn it into this vector space data, now the coefficient sitting in the front captures that numerical data. So what you can end up with at, as a typical vector then is something that actually as a vector represents the fact that I have different types, different quantities, and different roles. And when I now take a look at that linear map that's going to lift, that's going to be the lift of translating the place and role down to just place, what kind of linear map is it? It's got to be a projection. Now that projection we saw with the cat, dog, bird example was purely a binary matrix. It is either a mammal or not. However, there's no reason why that map, once you've got that linear map in, in your possession, you can't now do additional manipulations to it and change unit conversions or other type changes. Now that you know the right structure to be working. So in particular, the point of this example is to say that, well, if, in, if some of your numerical data reads out in different units, you can pack those unit conversions into this matrix that we built. So we can translate from 10 people, four people, and half dozen people. So this is a different kind of heterogeneity. This is a he numerical heterogeneity. This can be translated as well by packing it into this linear map. So we can convert units as well. Yes, that's right. That's right. So in essence, once you've got the once you've got this map through the categorification or got a version of it, then you can re you can further contextualize it by adding additional information. You're absolutely right. Okay. So what to do with vectorified data? There's lots of things you can do with vectorified data. Now that it's ve in vector spaces, I can do linear algebra. So the most famous theorem in linear algebra, or and if it's not, it should be, uh, is the, what's typically called the dimension theorem, or some people call it the fundamental theorem of linear algebra, says that if I have a linear map between two finite dimensional vector spaces, it's characterized by four fundamental spaces, sort of shown schematically here. The kernel, the co-image, the image, and the co-kernel. Well, what is the image? Well, the image of f is sort of the easiest one. It's what all the possible outputs of, the vector, of this linear map can be. The kernel are all the things that started out over in this vector space and got mapped to 0. And then the co-kernel is what's left over, what I haven't gotten to. And the co-image is also what's left over, all the things that didn't get sent to 0. So theorem, if I know these various fundamental spaces, then I know all the various isomorphism classes of the way this is usually proved is by doing a singular value decomposition. OK. So if I've got this going on, I can ask, what if I do multiple linear maps? One linear map and then another linear map. Because I've got lots of linear maps now floating around in, inside my sheet. What, are, what happens if I have multiple ones? Well, one thing that I might have is I might have this very special situation where the kernel of this map, the second map, is exactly the image of the first map. So everything that was the output of this map has gotten set to zero. That's kind of a special situation. This is called exactness. Uh, comes through a long history, especially from the exactness of taking certain kinds of derivatives. And the benefit of exactness is that there's a nice, very simple dimension theorem that plays along with it. They generalize the dimension theorem. Here's an example of an exact sequence. So if I take a look at the kernel of this map, or the image of this map, what's the image of this map? Well, it's zero. What's the kernel of this map? Well, this map is a full rank. It has no kernel. It doesn't send anything to zero except zero itself. If you look at it, you say, ah, oh, yes. If I take the vector x, y, and ask what gets sent to zero, well, it's going to get set to x, zero, y, zero. And of course, the only way that zero is if x is and y are zero. And this map here, if you look at it, the ones, the columns here match up exactly with the zeros there. So again, the kernel of this map is precisely the image of this map. And similarly here, the kernel of this map is precisely the image of that map. And this map here, the image of that thing is the whole thing, which is the kernel. OK, cool. So this is an example of an exact sequence. Good old linear algebra. OK. Exactness actually encodes useful properties. If I have an exact sequence that looks like 0, A, F, I don't know what F is per se, B, it says that F is injective. 
Why? Because the kernel of f is the image of that other map. That image of that other map is 0. This is how you encode a surjective, an onto map. The image of this map is the kernel of that map, says that's the image is everything. Cool. Uh, if I have an exact sequence like this, it says that f is an isomorphism. It's just a combination of those two examples. And if I extend it one bit further, this is how you can compute a quotient. Reason being, the <coughs> kernel of this map is the image of this map. So what it says is everything in, everything in A has gotten sent to 0 when I look over here, which is precisely the statement that you're looking at the quotient. So exact sequences are really handy. Exact sequences are not so common. It's special and delicate. Usually our sequences that we're going to see in the next few lectures are chain complexes, which rather than the kernel of G equaling the image of F, it's a little bigger, which means that if I take any two consecutive pair of maps, compose them, I get 0. So chain complexes, they're not exact. Exact sequences are chain complexes. And homology, which we've mentioned a bunch of times, measures precisely what the difference is. So in the category of chain complexes, you get diagrams like this. Top row is a chain complex, bottom row is a chain complex. This is a morphism in that category. That's what they look like, just defining it that way. Homology turns out that it's a bunch of functors taking chain complexes to vector spaces. What this essentially says is that homology is going to do something on chain complexes. So now I have to come clean. I have to tell you what homology is. Homo start with the chain complex. And what you do is you ask essentially what's the difference between the kernel and the image? Well, the quotient. So it's a vector space. And it says that all the vectors that have gotten eliminated at stage k, well, how much of them were in the image? When the image is exactly equal to the kernel, I'm quotienting out everything in the kernel. And so that's 0. So this homology gives you trivial vector spaces precisely when the chain complex is exact. Cool, OK. It's very abstract, and we'll make this a lot more concrete in the next few lectures. And I want to end with a pretty simple homological invariant. So homo this is homology. The homolo standard homological invariant is actually the Euler characteristic. You've probably heard of the Euler characteristic in other contexts. But basically what the Euler characteristic of a chain complex is, is you take the alternating sum of dimensions of these various vectors. So basically, negative 1 to the k times the dimension of v. We'll see in the next lecture why this is a useful choice. But if you just do this, and then do a little bit of linear algebraic computation, it's a good exercise to turn this statement into realize that it actually only depends on the homology. So this suggests, in particular, that the category of chain complexes is somehow too big. Really, you should only worry about the chain complexes up to homology. In particular, if you decategorify class of isomorphism classes of chain complexes fairly. So what's up next? We're going to build and mess around with some data that uses these categorification constructions. In the next lecture, we'll that now take this linear algebraic machine and use it to compute.